Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thank you so much for joining me today. This is April 2020, and exactly 50 years ago this month, the world witnessed the amazing story of Apollo 13. And it's my great honor to introduce my recent phone interview with astronaut Fred Hayes, who was a lunar module pilot for this amazing mission. Now, while Fred is perhaps best known for serving on the Apollo 13 mission, he was also very heavily involved on other Apollo missions, including serving as backup pilot for both Apollo 8 and Apollo 11. He was also backup commander for Apollo 16 and slated to be flight commander for the later canceled Apollo 19 mission. Fred was heavily involved in the initial space shuttle program, and in fact, he piloted the first test flight of the space shuttle Enterprise. Now, before we get to my interview with Fred, I'd like to ask for your support. If you can ring the bell if you're watching on YouTube, or if you're listening on your favorite podcast application, if you can give us a like and a comment there, we would certainly appreciate it. If you feel so inclined, we would love your support on patreon.com forward slash your space journey or patreon.com forward slash online coffee break. Either way, we really do appreciate your support. If you can share this episode with a friend, we'd appreciate that too. Uh, one other thing we'd love to have is this being a space episode. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what motivates you uh, for space, what you're excited about for the future of space exploration. And that we're going to introduce my segment called your space journey. And today I'm going to share a story of my friend, Jason Fields, no relation, but a good friend. Here's his story about what he's interested in for space. Hi, I'm Jason Fields. I'm with Florida is Sinking. Uh, It's a podcast based in Central Florida where we talk about all the crazy things in Florida and uh, just life here in general. My space journey began when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old. My family, I I grew up in Georgia. I live in Florida now, but uh, my family was vacationing in Florida from... uh, from Georgia and we took a trip to the Kennedy Space Center and this was probably in the early 90s I think I was 10 or 11 you know somewhere around in there but I remember being on the bus tour and uh, you know traveling about Kennedy Space Center and we passed the vehicle assembly building and I up until that point you know I was excited to be at Kennedy you know as much as a kid it with like normal interests are but when i saw that building it absolutely blew my mind and i couldn't believe that uh we built a building of that size and that rockets were assembled there like it all kind of came together in that moment and i decided that nasa was an amazing thing and that i was lucky to get to uh, see that and that you know we as normal citizens had access to go tour that and 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 just see those sites you know see where history actually took place you know i'm most excited about this commercialization of our space program because i believe that gives nasa a little more leverage to do the things that uh, it wants to do and and launching launching a a human being from the u.s again to me is is exciting you know we haven't had a launch from a, a u.s citizen launch from american soil since 2011 when atlantis launched and uh just to be able to to start launching people here. I feel like we're supposed to be doing that. And uh, to see that happen, you know, see it come into fruition now, it's exciting. I'm really excited about it. Your space journey. Thanks, Jason, for sharing your story. Folks, we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to share your space journey with us, give us a call at 317-862-4700. If you'd like to pre-record an audio or video clip, just send that to us at info at yourspacejourney.com. Now let's recap the amazing story of Apollo 13. The Apollo 13 mission was launched from Kennedy Space Center on April 11th, 1970. An explosion in one of the oxygen tanks two days into the mission prevented the three astronauts, Commander Jim Lovell, Command Module Pilot Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes, from landing on the moon. For four harrowing days, the entire world awaited the safe return of the crew, who successfully splashed down and were recovered in the South Pacific on April 17, 1970. Now I'm excited to introduce my phone interview with Fred Hayes. Again, this made my day, especially in this time and age. It's so nice to talk to who I consider a great American hero about this exciting event in our history. 
Now, as you may know, Fred actually served in the Marines, the Navy, and the Air Force. But before he started his military career, did you know that he actually was going to become a journalist? Here's Fred telling that story. I was actually in, in line to become a journalist. I really? got interested in the high school newspaper, sports editor, continued uh, thinking that was my major working for the Biloxi Gulfport Daily Herald in spare time to give me peewee games and you know things like that to do. Now, of course, Fred later decided to become a pilot. However, he had never actually flown before. I'd never been in an airplane in my life. I uh, had never been particularly interested in uh, aviation. And of course, the time I'm talking about is uh, late 1940s to early 1950s, so right. there was no space program. So I decided to join the service and serve my country and uh, went into flight training as a Navy cadet in the NAVCAD program mm -hmm. at Pensacola. And before I could graduate, the Korean War had ended uh, with an armistice about six months before I finished flight training. But I was commissioned as a Marine second lieutenant uh, with Naval Aviator Wings and went off to... Uh, my first squadron, uh, VMF 533, flying Banshee uh, jet aircraft, fighter bombers. Fred had an amazing early career as a pilot, later becoming a research pilot. But what motivated him to become an astronaut? Well, in this next clip, Fred was explaining how he actually was able to talk with Neil Armstrong uh, to find out what it was like to be an astronaut and why he decided to become an astronaut. Well, that was a very hard choice, uh, indecision to make, because by then, of course, uh, Gemini program was in swing, and Apollo, of course, was in the background that was going to happen, and people were going to go to the moon. I was thinking about that, and one time Neil come, came back and visited Ed, at Edwards at Flight Research Center, and Don Malik and I, another pilot, got a brief time set with Neil and asked him about what it was like being an astronaut down there in Houston. And his description, which turned out to be pretty true, was, uh, well... We uh, sit in a lot of meetings, uh, we sit in a simulator a lot, and there's not much good flying. But the thought of getting a chance to go to the moon, which certainly I looked at would be a great adventure, uh, was too hard to pass up. So I did apply in 1966, and uh, I guess I, apl I applied actually in the fall of 65, and was chosen as one of the group of 19 in April of uh, 1966. Uh, the original 19, we were named by John Young. One thing that really amazed me is Fred's first assignment at NASA was to help test the LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, which became so important later on in Apollo 13. Here's Fred telling about that assignment. Things were so busy and there was so much ground to cover that they went into what they call support crew assignments to cover the waterfront. And uh, Ed Mitchell and I were assigned to uh, Jim McDivitt who was uh, scheduled to fly uh, Apollo 8. At the time, it was Apollo 8. Mm -hmm. uh, was going to be the first mission to fly the lunar module. It was kind of interesting. We went to uh, Jim's office, sat down, and he, uh, we talked a little while, and his really only guidance uh, was a simple, almost one-sentence statement of it. He said, he said, I tell you, he said, I want uh, you and Ed to go to uh, Grumman, and make sure I got a good limb to fly. Nice. And that was it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Fred was assigned as backup crew for Apollo 8 and Apollo 11, among other Apollo missions later on in the program. But here he is talking about what it meant to be on the backup crew. Got trained to go fly Apollo 8, and uh, it's a backup to Bill Anders. And that was interesting, too. You know, Apollo 8 was originally Apollo 9. Yes. Because I mentioned McDivitt was going to fly 8. Mm -hmm. But the limb did not get ready, so they flip-flopped those two missions. So, in fact, when I was originally assigned as the backup to Apollo 8, when Mike Collins got a medical problem uh, and left the, the crew assignment, Jim Lovell moved up from the backup crew to be the command module pilot on Apollo 9 mm -hmm. at that time. And that opened a slot for me to become the backup lunar module pilot to Bill Anders. And I was in the backup crew with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. You trained equally to a, a prime crew. Right. You were prepared to uh, go fly, and so you'd done all the hard work. 
except you got to watch somebody else go flying. Now, before the flight of Apollo 13, as Fred explains, the mood was a little subdued. There was a last-minute switch of astronauts where Jack Swagger came in. Um, but unlike the movie Apollo 13, Jack was extremely well-prepared for this mission. Here's Fred talking about that. Well, I, I guess I'd say our, our launch uh, period, right immediately leading up to launch, was a little bit subdued. I was, of course, excited that I was finally getting to fly. Mm -hmm. It was subdued because of the crew changeout, and not the way, uh, in any way, the way the movie portrayed it. There, there was big concern about Jack filling in for Ken because the same things I just described. We knew Jack was uh, trained to go fly the mission, right. very capable. Of, Technically, he might have missed out on some of the last uh, meetings with the photo guys uh, who kept changing everything Yes, <laughs> for the photo plan. But that was about the only thing Jack might have sort of been behind Ken. Now, again, what was fascinating to me is that Fred was a rookie for the flight of Apollo 13. Here he is talking about what he was expecting and what he experienced as a rookie on his first space flight. Well, the, the, I've always described the two things— uh, Different struck me as being most different from my aircraft flying experience was the views out the window. Even though we were at fairly low altitude, less I think about 110 miles altitude or less, a little less. But of course, I'd been in airplanes, uh, zoom flights. I'd been to almost 90,000 feet in the 104. Mm, wow! But uh, 90,000 feet is not 100 and something miles, so. It still was a different perspective yes. with sunrises and sunsets very quickly. We only went around a couple of times before heading uh, out to the moon. So that was, uh, and of course, the sights at approaching and en route into the moon and approaching the moon. And the one circle around the backside, even those kind of looks out the window, time seemed, uh, am I really here looking at what I'm looking at? The only other... Uh, unusual thing was being able to float around, you know, in zero G yourself or objects, that kind of thing. It's kind of euphoric, uh, sensation. Otherwise all the G levels, uh, vibration, shake, rattle and roll, all that launch and entry were less than I'd experienced in airplanes. Now the movie Apollo 13 also sort of jokes around about the cabin repress valve and how Fred would use this and, sort of startle the astronauts. Now, Fred actually emphasized this was not for fun. It was just his style and his way of uh, doing what the mission called for. In the procedure, uh, either setting up the vehicle or shutting down, there was a step you did that, and it would make a bang. And normally, out of, normally you would, I guess most people would tell the rest of the crew, I'm going to throw this valve and it's going to make a sound, a sort of a bang. Right. And I often, uh, in testing we did over the period, uh, wouldn't bother telling them, so I'd give them a little surprise. Now, on April 13th, 1970, two days into the Apollo 13 mission, there was an oxygen tank explosion on board. Here's Fred talking about that experience. At the time this happened, I was still in the lunar module putting things back in storage where they belonged that we had pulled out for the TV show. And we kind of did a show and tell thing. And as soon as I could drift up through the tunnel and got to uh, my right couch position, uh, looking at the scan in the instrument panel, uh, which of course had about six or seven caution lights on, war caution warning lights on, the master alarm and the blue computer restart light. The gauges for the oxygen, cryogenics, oxygen, hydrogen on oxygen tank tube in two different meters, the needles were at the bottom of those gauges. Uh, those were fed by different sensors, unlikely multiple sensors fail at one time. Right. So it was almost for sure we had lost oxygen tank two. And I was just sick to my stomach yeah. uh, with disappointment because I knew without reference and mission rules uh, that this constituted an abort. And we had lost the, uh, you know, the, probably even going in the lunar orbit, much less landing. Right. And all that work and two previous missions, and now here, uh, a big chance and landing on the moon and walking on the moon was gone in an, in, in an instant. I did not think it was life-threatening. Uh, tank one looked okay at the time. 
So we had kept everything fully powered up and just come home ASAP. Now, of course, the astronauts weren't able to land on the moon, but they did get to go around the moon. Here's Fred talking about that amazing experience of looking down at the moon and what he felt and saw at that time. Well, it, it was uh, obviously an incredible sight to, uh, to see it up close. Uh, when I say up close, we were a little over 130 miles above it. Right. Uh, at the max uh, height as we went around to feed, see this lifeless, uh, beat up uh, rock. It's, it's a way with different shades of, from dark to a, almost a white light color of gray. And uh, of course, the moon has no atmosphere, it has no visible water. And it's just uh, compared to the beautiful Earth, you could see way far away where you still had color. It was colorized. It uh, nice. still had blues of oceans, appearances, uh, browns of continents, and you could even see cloud patterns. The moon was obviously quite bizarre uh, compared to the Earth. It was clear it would not likely be a very ha- habitable place uh, for us humans. Now, since Fred had been so heavily involved in the testing of the limb, he had a lot of confidence in it which uh, really was necessary because as they shut systems down, there was a concern for safety and the survival of the crew for the mission. Here's Fred talking about that. I had a lot of confidence in the, the limb because, I'd, again, I'd been so involved. Of course, uh, there, w- there was always a concern that when you use a vehicle, not quite like it was planned to be used because we, we had the power down severely to make sure the six uh, batteries, that was the primary power for the landing craft, that it would now make make it for four days rather than its planned two-day lifetime. Mm-hmm. And uh, the vehicle did get very chilly. Uh, secondary uh, concern, though, was the uh, water separator uh, at that lower temperature was not functioning uh, properly, and so it was not getting rid of, rid of the, the moisture the, from our breathing the moist air out each breath and water was building up that we could see in the limb because it has no inner wall. Mm -hmm. It has netting material. We couldn't afford the weight of a wall. And you can see through the netting at the wiring bundles and the connectors and plumbing uh, lines and water globules that really were building up at every turn of a wiring bundle or at the connector interfaces or turn in the plumbing. So, that that was concerned about electric shorts. And of course that same thing was in the command module when Jack and I got in the power it up two and a half hours before entry. We went that's when they gave us the go ahead to start the power up. Jack had got out towels to wipe off the instrument panel, which was covered with water. And uh so same thing we worried about. It turns out what's what precluded that uh was the call it the goodness of a tragedy in an accident of the Apollo 1 fire. After any accident, aircraft accident, or in that case, spacecraft, you have an accident board and they go through all the causal effects and of course present what you should do different to preclude that happening again. And of course the big thing people know about is they redesigned the hatch so it would open outward. The crew was trapped in there during that time, a whole new hatch design. And a number of other things, but one one that say does was the, a very much stricter criteria on wiring. That had to be ties every so many inches along a wire bundle, hold it tightly together. That anyway, you had a clamp and it had to be perfectly round and not egg-shaped hole in the wiring. Hmm. And and most importantly, hermetically sealed the connectors with a thinker think a material called Melkor where the wiring went into connector, uh, like 48-pin connectors or whatever size, that ceiling made them waterproof. Oh, really? So that's what precluded us, even though we had all this abundance of water everywhere and behind behind panels and on all the wiring, we never got an electric shark. Now, 50 years later, I was amazed at how Fred seems to remember this story so well. Obviously, it's really ingrained in his memory. Here's Fred talking about that. I've... Reto- retold the story lots of times. So that that's kept it kind of fresh in my mind, which in some respects makes it seem not that long ago. Of course, when I look at a calendar, it's very clear. 
and, <laughs> and with my strength and strength and walking ability or running ability or whatever, yes, I know it's been a long time. Now, as I mentioned, after Apollo, Fred went on to help with the space shuttle program and was the first pilot of the space shuttle Enterprise. Here's Fred talking about that experience. Then I was involved to, through the whole design development of the uh, orbiter at, at Rockwell. Then I got the pleasure of going back to the astronaut office when I was named to be the commander of Crew 1 of the two crews that would get to fly Enterprise. So it was, it was kind of a womb to tomb episode where I was there from day one of the development through getting to fly the first flight. Now, of course, Fred has seen the initial space program all the way through current days of SpaceX and their reusable rockets. So I asked him, what is he excited about? What does he think about the future of space exploration? Here's Fred talking about that. I'd like to see continued exploration in any vein we can uh, do it, unmanned and manned, because I'm kind of interested in uh, the future of the human race. I'm interested in... uh, how, what is this all about? I mean, this big universe we're in, you know, all, all aspects in that regard. I think, I think the creator would have wanted us to use uh, uh, to the best we can and affordability uh, that the talent uh, we've been blessed with. We're uniquely, at least, the only creatures we we know. Of course, we don't we don't know that much outward in the universe, but at least on Earth, we're the only creatures that have ever evolved. That couldn't can do it. There's no other creature, even though they say dolphins are smart and they're not going to build a starship. <laughs> and uh, so we, we're uh, we should be using our talent uh, in that, in that direction. So I think it's a goodness thing. Online coffee break. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with Fred today. Hope you did too. Uh, Fred actually is very actively involved as a board of director for the Infinity Science Center. So if you'd like to learn more about them, just go to their website at visitinfinity.com. I want to thank Fred for taking time for my phone call. I want to thank you for taking time to join us today. Really do appreciate it. Again, if you'd like to share this episode with a friend, we would certainly love that. Thank you again for taking time to join us today. We'll see you next time. God bless.